few weeks on Jesus Christ himself, focusing on his uh, message, his mission, and his mandate. And certainly if we're going to uh, walk in the way that he has shown us how, then we need to keep our eyes focused on him because the way that he is showing us is certainly not uh, a way that we will see uh, modeled by anyone other than him. He, he is the, the truest and the greatest and the most perfect model of what it is God wants for us uh, in terms of how he wants us to live, how he wants us to treat one another, how he wants us to love him and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God's revelation to us. And so it is only rightful that we pay very close attention to what he said and close attention to what he did so that we can follow in the way. That's what disciples do. They learn from the master teacher. And as we said on last week, we call Jesus master because he is uh, the supreme teacher. He is our instructor for life. He is our instructor in righteousness. And when he left to go back to the Father, he promised us the Holy Spirit, whose role would be to be our teacher. Well, we're going to take a look today at uh, what Jesus wants to get done through us. Not that we're going to forsake our focus on him, but I just want to uh, have a window of opportunity right here to talk about what he wants to get done through us. He, he came uh, from glory to earth to show us what God's will for our lives are. And so it's incumbent upon us uh, to always search our hearts and minds about how we're going to respond to him how we're going to answer his call on our lives. Uh, he did not program us like robots uh, to obey him. Uh, he made us with free will. He gave us a mind to think, and he gave us, uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to say yea or nay uh, to the knock on the door to come in and uh, to sup with us and to be sovereign, to be Lord of our lives. That is something that we have to surrender. That is something that we have to give him. Uh, so uh, he does not overwhelm us with himself. He comes and presents himself, introduces himself by way of his Holy Spirit. And it will always be our daily responsibility uh, to say yes to his will. I want to share out of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 to 38. Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 to 38. And Jesus went all went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So clearly Jesus is looking for followers. He's looking for laborers. He's looking for us to be the persons that uh, learn from him how to uh, do the work that he is doing. The ver verse 35 says he went about teaching, he went about preaching, and he went about healing. This is our Lord's trifold ministry, the trifold focus of his ministry. To teach because we are in darkness, because we're ignorant of the ways of God. 
to preach because it is his heart's desire to persuade us to uh, use our free will to say yes preaching is about persuasion teaching is about giving you information about giving you enlightenment opening up your understanding but then preaching is about persuading you to make a decision about what you've learned preaching is about persuading you to have a response to what you have learned because a lot of times we get in situations where we're just learning for knowledge sake but we have no intention of doing anything with that knowledge except demonstrating that we're a know-it-all. <laughs> well, Jesus doesn't need know-it-alls because he knows it all. He's omniscient. What he needs is laborers. What he needs are people whose response to what they have learned about the kingdom of God is to say, here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll be a laborer. I'll be a worker. I will do your will. So Jesus came teaching because he needed to turn on the light in the midst of darkness and impart a new understanding to those who were seeking God. But he kept on preaching as well as teaching because the people needed to be persuaded to make a commitment. And uh, a lot of people saw his miracle working power and they were awestruck, but not everybody made a decision to actually follow him. He came teaching, he came preaching, he came healing. Jesus came into a situation where there was a lot of sickness, a lot of distress and disease among the people, especially his own people that were up under the foot of oppression. And so uh, he came into a situation that needed remedy, that needed both medicine and miracle, that needed uh, the intervention of someone who really could make a difference in how people were living. And what is clear to me about the Lord is he wasn't all about talk. He was a lot about walk. He went where the people were. He didn't wait for them to come to the synagogues. So he, he preached to those who were there, but this says he went about all their, silly, all their cities and villages. That meant he went to places large and small. And when he sent his disciples out, he said, go into the what? Hedges and the highways, which meant he wanted to go, wanted them to go to the places that were heavily trafficked and heavily populated, but to also go to the places where people were more isolated, where people were more uh, separated, where people were more forgotten. That's the Jesus that we are following. And to them, he taught, he preached, he healed. And when he saw people in their various life situations, uh, he had compassion on them. He didn't act like he didn't see them. He didn't turn his nose up at them and act like he was better. He didn't go walk away talking about, well, they shoulda, coulda, woulda done this. Uh, he didn't go away uh, making excuses for them, but he went away, uh, he came to them in their situations and ministered to them where they were. So if they were in the temple among the religious elite, uh, he had a message for them. If they were in the muck and the mire of the back streets and alleys of the cities that he was uh, traversing, he had a message for them. And uh, we, we often hear in the scriptures where after he has spoken a word and after he has done his deeds, uh, the, the people, the common people go away saying, never a man spake like this man. But they weren't just talking about his eloquence. They weren't just talking about his profundity. They were talking about how they felt when they heard him speak, how he moved them to believe that what he was saying actually applied to them. That's why in the synagogue when you hear Jesus talking about his mandate as we discussed last week, uh, you hear him quoting Isaiah saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. <laughs> Help Holy Ghost. And so if poor people heard in his message 
that they were somebody, help me Holy Ghost, then it was clear that he has not just come to kings and princes, he's come to every man because God's intention was to reach the whole wide world and to have his gospel uh, go and be delivered to people who are out front and up front, but also to those who had to be searched out. And so you see Jesus landing his ship in the country of the Gadarenes, for instance. He's supposed to be on his way where? To the big city. But he docks his ship in the country of the Gadarenes, where there are few, if anybody, because the country of the Gadarenes was basically tombs. It was a cemetery that he landed uh, that he landed in, and there was one whose name was Legion, a man possessed of demons, a man who was tormented, a man who was out of his mind, a man so distressed that uh, he couldn't even be taken care of at home. He, he couldn't be allowed to be among normal citizenry. He couldn't go sit out on the porch in a rocking chair on a sunny day. No, they didn't want him around, and so they sent him to the tombs where, where if Jesus had not come along, he would have done himself in. But the compassion of our Lord is such that wherever he saw uh, people faint and weary and sick uh, and in need of a helping hand or a tender touch or an encouraging word, uh, he was there to provide it. And not for just someone like Legion, but what about the woman leaning up uh, against uh, Jacob's well, the, the woman who came out uh, <clears throat> at a certain time of day to avoid the crowd, to get some water to take back home, and met up with Jesus, who had no business uh, being out there talking to no woman, as far as his disciples were concerned. But they come back and find him ministering to someone who was poor in spirit, poor in spirit in that she had been married five times, still had not found joy and happiness, still had not found herself, but was giving herself uh, away over and over again in hopes of finding joy and happiness. Here comes Jesus saying, I've got water you can't put in that bucket, and I've got water that doesn't run out. It's a water that springs up from within you and lets you know that you are indeed a child of God. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. He's looking for laborers who work like that. He's looking for laborers who have a heart like that. And so uh, I, re I repeat a, a consistent theme from our earlier Bible studies, and that is you really have to make up your mind when you put your focus on Jesus, how much do you really, really want to be like him, uh, given uh, his ways, given his heart, given the, the controversies that he stirs up, given the fact that sometimes he's lifted up by the multitudes and other times he's run out of town uh, for what he has to say and who he chooses to hang with, you really have to come to the end of the day saying, how much do I really want to be like Jesus? But that is what discipleship is all about, how closely uh, you want to be identified with the Master. Because the closer you identify with him, uh, the more it is likely that you will have the same kind of experience that he had and the same kind of responses from people that he received. Uh, remember now, they did not always call him son of God. A lot of times they called him the son of the devil. They did not understand his ways and uh, were not necessarily... Uh, trying to at, at some point. They just wanted to be rid of him so they could have his own way. There were varied responses and varied levels of commitment even when the response was positive. Some people wanted to go all the way but other folk just wanted to go to the corner. So you have to decide when you see him how much you really want to be like him. Matthew 10 1 right, right in the very next chapter uh, we have a series of, of verses at the beginning of a couple of the Gospels where Jesus is clearly uh, giving his disciples power to do uh, what he himself is doing. 
and as we see him granting power to his disciples you have to wonder how much of that power is available to us today given that the world definitely needs people who are change agents people who uh, do have a compassionate heart people uh, who are not fearful to come against the powers that be in this world uh, with the confidence that we're on the winning team. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 says that uh, when Jesus had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. In Mark, the sixth chapter, and the seventh verse. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. So these verses make it clear he didn't just take them to school. After he schooled them, he wanted to send them. But when he sent them, he sent them with power. Glory, hallelujah. I wonder how many of us today actually feel like or discern that God has invested power in us to do the kinds of things he was doing. I wonder how many of us have tried our hand at some healing lately, have, have tried our hand at coming against unclean spirits. And, and, and when we say that, I'm not trying to be super spiritual about it either because unclean spirits really have to do with anything that is immoral, anything that is wayward and disobedient in terms of knowing what is right and doing what is wrong, uh, understanding what is righteous but doing what is unrighteous anyhow. Uh, an in, uh, unclean spirit uh, is anything that disturbs and disrupts your fellowship with God that is itself ungodly. Oh, glory be to God. And we know that uh, whatever is counter to the Spirit of God uh, is, is sin. So whatever is counter to the will of God is sin. And so whenever our flesh, whenever our ego dominates and, and takes over uh, our spirit takes over a spirit that is desirous of being uh, right with God and, and to doing what is pleasing in his sight. We know we're in the realm of uncleanness. Uh, anything that takes pleasure in corrupt thoughts and actions is unclean. In short, anything that separates you from what you know to be or understand to be the will and way of God is uncleanness. Uncleanness. So let's not make it so super spiritual. Let's not turn it into uh, something that sounds like Halloween. Let's let's not just turn it into turn it into something so spiritual that we uh, we neglect to deal with it or or accept that we have some responsibility to do anything about it. Uh, we're not talking. Uh, uh, the, the exorcist here. Uh, that might be a manifestation of it, one manifestation of it, but we've got uncleanness that we see on the television every week, every day. Every day you turn in the television, and right through here, a whole lot of uncleanness. If you've got black men hanging from trees uh, in suspicious circumstances, uh, you know that ain't what we do. That is not what we do in our right minds, and, and uh, there's no indication that the people who have been found hanging from trees lately were not in their right mind. Somebody in an evil spirit, somebody with an unclean spirit, uh, assaulted and, and, and took the life of somebody uh, because they thought they were 
better because they wanted to have rule over them because they saw them as something less than humane. Uh, when people who wear badges shoot other folk who are innocent uh, and unarmed in the street, that, 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 that's an unclean spirit. That's an evil, demonic presence that needs to be tamed, that needs to be exorcised, if you will. And so uh, when we talk about unclean spirits, we're not talking about some, something so otherworldly that it's not ever so present in the world that we're living in. And I'm, I, for one, am especially glad to see that the followers of Christ uh, have the promise of power being invested in us because it is the Lord's desire to use us to come against those spirits. And uh, uh, if I, I read the Gospels correctly, when you're on the Lord's side, you're on the winning team because evil came against him in the strongest fashion possible and he proved victorious. And so after he teaches them, he sends them, but he sends them with power to come against unclean spirits. And so we, we pray for those who, uh, with a sense of holy boldness, we pray for those who with a sense of righteousness, with a sense of redemption, with a heart's desire to uh, cleanse our society, of the evil that uh, results in murder and mayhem, we pray for them uh, to realize and recognize that they are on the right side of history and that they are on the same side that the Lord himself came to be on the side of. Now notice that when Jesus came against these powers that be himself, when he came against unrighteousness and evil in high places, he did so with the love of God. He did so with the power of the Spirit. He did so with the power of truth. And uh, history has vindicated that those who have come in like manner uh, have the authority of heaven behind them. And uh, we are not looking to take up arms for arms. We're not looking to be militant in the way that trades bullet for bullet because our confidence, our faith, and our hope is that uh, the hope we have in Jesus Christ and the way that he came against the powers that be uh, is, is a winning strategy. And so let us be full of prayer when it's time to uh, hit the streets to do so nonviolently. When we speak truth to power, we do so with a sense of compassion because our God not only wants to win over the victims, he wants to win over the victimizers. And so uh, in order to do that, those who, who would bring about redemptive change have to have the right spirit in them. And that is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So essentially when Jesus calls the 12 to him and then teaches them and then sends them out, he's sending them out to do the same work that he is doing. And the question that I wrote in the margin of my notes is, is that too much excitement for us? Uh, are the laborers few because what Jesus has asked of us is too much for us to engage in? Do we only want the fireside chat, but not fired up to go and actually uh, act on what we have learned? Uh, Jesus took time in the temple, but he spent a whole lot more time in the street. He took his disciples uh, to Gethsemane for prayer, but there was much more time spent healing, casting out demons, and coming against those who uh, were mistreating uh, uh, the citizenry in such a way that they were not concerned about their, their good and welfare. Um, so uh, part of the message here of Jesus and, and the training of his own disciples is don't fall short of doing whatever Christ gives you power to do because you've not demonstrated that you have any miracle working power of your own. There's plenty of healing. There's plenty of demon casting that you can do with the power that you have if you're willing to access 
uh, more of the Holy Spirit and give more uh, room for the Holy Spirit to move in your own life. And that doesn't come by, uh, that doesn't come unintentionally. Uh, for us to be filled up uh, with the Spirit, help Holy Ghost, there are disciplines that the Lord gives us uh, that make our uh, relationship stronger and to allow us to be uh, recipients of a fuller presence of God. The word says anybody who asks the Spirit to come in uh, will have the Spirit uh, come in to their hearts. So you, you have the Spirit come into your lives by the faith to believe in Christ. With that comes the gift of the Spirit. But uh, there's a difference between having a touch and having a visitation and being full, help me Holy Ghost, of the Spirit. Uh, with more prayer, with more faith, there is more fruit of the Spirit. With more prayer, with more study of the Word, there is a closer walk with God. And with that comes greater power. And to the degree that we see uh, the, the powers that be are powerful. The, the people who are occupying uh, the seats in government are very powerful. Uh, the people who are taking up arms in the street uh, against us are very powerful. And, and so if we're going to uh, come against those kinds of spirits, if we're going to come against uh, the kind of wayward thinking that demeans a person so much that you can treat them any old kind of way, then you've got to come against that spirit with more of the fruit of having God's spirit in you. Uh, take you to another familiar verse, familiar verses in Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 26. I think sometimes we forget what we are supposed to look like, what our character is supposed to uh, exhibit when we are full of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verses 19 to 26. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, the Word says, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. And here's a verse that there deserves some focus. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And that means that as people who, who have the Holy Spirit at work in us, the expectation is that we would have a very positive impact on the lives of other people who are uh, maybe less mature in the spirit than we are or, or persons who have not the spirit of God but uh, the spirit of the adversary that those persons are not persons to be written off uh, as, as lost but are to be uh, the object of our love and compassion in hopes of restoring them to what God means for them to live like as well as us. 
I think we, we tend to shortchange the power of the Holy Spirit that once we get saved, we don't think he can do the same thing for some other wretched creatures that we know. But uh, let us not forget how far the Lord brought us, and how long the Lord has kept us, and uh, our, our ability to have a witness that says we are saved and sanctified is not by our own doing, is not by our own works, is by our surrender of our will to the will of God to make us what he would have us to be. So don't fall short of, of uh, using uh, the power of the Spirit that's in you to be a blessing to others uh, who might well come to Christ if they see Christ at work in you. Let's talk a little bit about coming against unclean spirits. Galatians 6 1 says, If you see someone overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Do it in meekness. Do it considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Meaning, don't do it arrogantly thinking that you are better. Because uh, if you juggle your memory a little bit, you probably can remember uh, times when you walked the same way, did the same things. Uh, the context of the church at Galatia is such that it was a church planted by Paul. It had some Jews in it, but mostly Gentiles. And what they knew of religion was very legalistic and very ritualistic. They, they observed a lot of special days and a lot of sacrifices. Uh, the Apostle Paul would later call those special days, sacrifices, and rituals slavery. <laughs> Paul was trying to get people to walk by faith rather than walk by uh, the laws and the rituals that they thought were keeping him in a, them in a right relationship with God. He wanted them to walk in the spirit of Christ uh, where they had previously only known the law and only known God as a judge. But when the Galatians received the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of love, salvation by grace through faith the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to make us a new creation bearing the fruit of the Spirit governed by an internal law when they heard that gospel they learned how to appreciate and celebrate and live in their newfound freedom praise the Lord because it was clear to those who were ritualistic and living by the ordinances and the sacrifices that they had learned to make. It was clear to them that uh, it was not bringing them any closer to a right relationship with God. It, it did not give them the satisfaction that it was well with their soul. And uh, not having that satisfaction, many returned to their old ways of thinking and their old practices that they were comfortable with because people who are ritualistic and legalistic, they like to go to bed at night checking off the list of things that they believe they did right and to comfort themselves by uh, believing that uh, there's nobody who was more right than them, uh, nobody better than them. And, and they could let themselves off the hook uh, for a lot of shortcomings as long as, as long as they saw other people having shortcomings. But, but for us, Christ is the standard, and there is no shortcoming in him. And so no matter how good we think we are, or how great we believe ourselves to be, uh, we are always coming short of the glory of the one who is perfect. And so Paul preached a gospel that uh, gave people the assurance of their salvation, not by the letter of the law, but by the gift of of grace and mercy that comes from Jesus Christ. So when Paul says brothers and sisters, brethren, uh, if you see somebody overtaken in a fall, he's talking to a particular group. He's talking to a particular religious group. He's not talking to strangers when he says brethren. Uh, he's talking to members of the body of Christ and suggests that we are family. And uh, he says, if you see someone overtaken, someone caught in a sin, then uh, you ought to spend more time trying to see that person apart from their faults 
uh, you ought to spend more time trying to see that person in the same light as Christ himself does. So uh, you remember when he took his disciples out on the field trip and they came upon the blind man, they, they had a rush to judgment about the man being a sinner. Whereas Jesus could see that he was a man who just needed to be able to see and minister to uh, his pain and his peril where he was. Uh, but at times when it was clear that the onlookers uh, mindset was on sin and, and not just the, uh, the disease or the, the healing that was necessary, he would let them know he had authority to do both. <laughs> he could heal the body and he could heal the spirit. And so for their satisfaction, sometimes he would say, get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven you and take care of the whole matter in one fell swoop. I have authority from God to heal the body and heal the soul. Uh, and that made him a minister for the whole person. Seeing people as they really are involves the physical and the intuitive because there's always more than what meets the eye to any person. There is history, there are health conditions, there are family uh, uh, history and ties, there's uh, the faith or the lack of any. Not very, uh, it's not very merciful or gracious when we see people overtaken in a fault, not to try to consider more than what we see, uh, but to consider what Jesus himself sees when he looks beyond the surface. Even in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, the wise writer uh, uh, Solomon in Proverbs writes, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So the, the writer of Proverbs is saying, keep mercy and keep truth real close together uh, because you may know the truth about somebody you may know the 411 on them but where is the mercy uh, that is to accompany what it is you believe you know uh, let not mercy and truth forsake you but keep them bound tightly together around your neck ye which are spiritual who live in the spirit how do you know how do you know that you or, or whoever else is spiritual. You know a person is spiritual because they're practicing spiritual disciplines. They do it with regularity. They don't do it only in a state of emergency. Uh, if you're a praying person, you don't wait for trouble to come. If you're a worshiper, uh, you're going to worship the Lord whether you're in the house or out of the house. If you're a student of the word, you're going to search the scriptures on your own whether you have a teacher to take you through or not. Uh, if you're spiritual every now and then, you know you've got to give up something to get closer to the Lord when those some things have become uh, so distracting that you can't hear his voice. That's what fasting and prayer is all about. Uh, sacrificing something you need for the body so the spirit can have what it needs to be strong. Uh, when you are bearing spiritual fruit, then you're a spiritual person. When you're a person of love, a person of joy, of peace, of forbearance, when kindness comes easier to you, when goodness is second nature to you, when you're more faithful than disobedient, when you're more gentle than you are mean, when you're more self-controlling than you are acting wild and unruly, when you have a spiritual disposition and your conduct follows suit, that's how you know that you are a spiritual person and spiritual people God can use to do the things that he himself was indeed doing. Restoration. You who are spiritual restore folk who you find in faults and in sins, who offend and transgress. So the legalistic judgmental mindset would be to separate somebody isolate somebody, judge somebody, condemn somebody, and ultimately destroy somebody who is full of uh, uh, disobedience and unrighteousness. And we saw that Jesus was in contention with that disposition 
all throughout his ministry. Remember, he, 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 he came into a situation where uh, the, the religious elite wanted to stone the woman to death, having been caught in the act of adultery. He didn't let her off the hook for her sin. He just said, if you're going to stone her, then, you know, hey, you know, it, it must mean that you don't think you've done anything wrong. And so they dropped the stones and left her with Jesus. There are a lot of situations where we ought to leave people in the hands of the Lord than take up stones to destroy them or to banish them or to condemn them. Because in the spirit of meekness, we recognize that uh, if it were not for the mercy of God, uh, we ourselves would be destroyed. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 to 6 it says though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare oh bless the Lord this is a word we need today the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 says, Put on the whole armor of God, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the spirit, the word of God. And if you can't tell that right now there's a warfare going on that is aptly described by just those words, then you don't know what time it is. Uh, we are in, as Christians, as spiritual people, very much in a battle against the adversary and all of the imaginations of those who've thrown any sense of decency to the wind. And uh, we're living in a time when in the highest offices of the land uh, the lid has been taken off and the ground has shaken loose uh, those who, had, uh, who at least used to have some shame, some embarrassment uh, to their immorality and to their denigration and to their, their ugly ways of treating one another. But now there has been given a, a green light to come out from under and to, to take up arms and to hit the streets and to wear whatever badge is your badge and wave whatever banner is your banner, don't care what it is uh, that you believe or, 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 or uh, wear, that, uh, that, wear that belief and those sentiments uh, will actually take our society. So in the midst of spiritual warfare to be sure and uh, what God wants to get through us, get done through us is to have us possess the same spirit that he had of righteousness, of truth, of faith, and of love, and to be confident that those weapons will win uh, in the fight against uh, the adversary that we come against. And so let us be the kind of disciples of Christ that model his virtues, that model his values, and are willing to be bold about uh, coming against the powers that be so that cleansing might be possible at a time when clearly uh, the land needs to be healed of its iniquity. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we bless and thank you that you are a mighty God indeed. And what we see, Lord God, we pray, will not cause us to run for cover as much as to stand up for what is right and what is true, and what is honest and what is of good report. We pray that you would keep these things on our mind and that you would, Lord God, help us to be agents to bring them to pass in every community in which we live. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would reign and be sovereign and that your will will be done to bring the kingdom of this world uh, into the kingdom of our God. So let it be written, so let it be done according to your word and will and forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. And give us, Lord, the power to be overcomers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, saints. God bless you, saints. All's well? Yes. Yes.
All is well. God is good. God is good. Well, we're pressing on here at the church, and uh, our in-person services have been going very well, and uh, we trust that you're able to receive the the worship and the word where you are, and uh, we are doing our best to make sure that uh, people in their own time of, of comfort and uh, confidence are able to come back to a house that's prepared and uh, ready to receive you. But uh, keep tuning in and keep praying for one another. We'll do our best to keep you informed and to keep you connected. And whether we're in the house or in our own house, God is blessing us with his presence so that we can be a sanctuary wherever we are. Have a glorious day and uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.